Welcome to Business Zone. I'm Yemisi Landre Ido. With Thursday's news that South Africa's competition watchdog recommends prosecution of 17 banks for rigging the RAND keeps getting reactions. Now, South Africa's President Jacob Zuma told Parliament that the government will come down hard on the local banks accused in the report. But opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, uh, says the timing of the Competition Commission's price-fixing case involving this bank seems suspicious and political. Well, this comes hot on the heels of President Zuma's State of the Nation address, in which he made it clear that the competition authorities will be used as one of the main tools of radical economic transformation. Zuma said banks often treated poor black people unfairly due to their lack of collateral. Well, the top four banks are APSA, Standard Bank, FNB and Nedbank. And the three local banks mentioned in the latest collusion case are Investec, Standard Bank and APSA. All right, I spoke with the Chief Executive Officer, Rich Management, Ali Kensachi, and he told me about the impact this would have on earnings. You are right. I mean, reputational risk is now a big thing. Uh, uh, clients uh, who, who feel that their banks have uh, taken egregious profits or gouged them, yeah, it, it, it's not possible to operate in that kind of manner uh, anymore. So yes, I think it, it, it adds complexity, but you're talking about events which were a long time ago, and I think there's so much distance. And this is one of the challenges for the regulators. They're just way too slow out of the gates. You know, they, they catch up with things 10 years later. By that time, the world moves on. And this is essentially the challenge, I think, for regulators all over the world. They, they just can't keep ahead of the curve. They're typically very behind it. And unfortunately, you know, the speed that we, in which we live, the way business moves, it's going to be difficult to pin something that happened 10 years ago, uh, which is not 100% clear to me on these banks at this point. Well, Charles Kirk, CEO and Chief Energy Economist, Afri Foresight, South Africa, joins me now via Skype on this latest. Many thanks for your time, Charles. Worldwide... Many thanks. Now, worldwide, we see financial regulators clamping down on this kind of cases. And we see that dozens of traders are fired and big banks fined around $10 billion. Now, if these allegations are seen to be true, what do you think would be happening in South Africa? Uh, well, this is, of course, uh, on the one side, there is the financial issue, but also very much tied into the politics, as you mentioned earlier with President Zuma in his State of the Nation address last week, making a very big song and dance about the concentration of power in big corporations. You, those top four banks that you mentioned earlier control 90% of the market, uh, the banking market. Uh, so this is absolute uh, manna, manna from heaven for uh, President Zuma to clamp down on these, um, among these banks uh, which has also become a bit of a political football after the, uh, some of these banks cancelled uh, the known uh, Zuma collaborators, the Gupta, Gupta's accounts last year. Uh, so this couldn't have come at a worse time for, for the banks in, uh, in this case. So on the cards definitely is more um, regulation for these banks. Uh, which on the flip side is not necessarily a bad thing, considering that uh, it was the lack of banking regulation that had a big hand in causing the financial crisis of 2008-2009. Yeah, if, uh, but what really is the implication of this to the economy? These are fictitious bids and these allegations, I will tell you, uh, is a really serious matter, knowing that some 30% of daily turnover in the rank takes place in South Africa, of which... Foreigners account for 58%. Um, absolutely. Uh, and, over, and over and above the financial amounts involved, it is the confidence in the banking, in the banking system that has been compromised now. Uh, customers are not getting the best deal, and how can they trust the banks that they will be getting, that they will be getting the best deal? So this can definitely shake up the market if... Uh, people don't have confidence in the banks. Yeah, there is a likely settlement of 10% as recommended by the commission, but we know that most banks don't disclose or split out their foreign exchange 
trading revenue. Will this make it difficult to calculate the likely fine? Well, for us in the public, yes, uh, there is a amount of about 70 billion rand of fines that have been mentioned. But those fines have been calculated on the overall turnover of the banks, whereas the actual fine will only be calculated, as you mentioned, on the foreign exchange portion. Uh, but but those that kind of information will obviously be available to the Competition Commission investigators. Uh, but be that as it may, the fine should be quite a bit smaller than the 70 billion mentioned. And of course, UPSA has already been been uh, exonerated of the fines because of their uh, um, cooperation in the in the investigation. So the fines will probably turn out to be just a drop in the ocean. Yeah, but Charles, let's talk about this. In this, in your own view, do you think it's a case of politics or uh, it's actually impeccable and impeccable behavior on the side of these banks? Uh, well, definitely it would appear that, and, and, and it's not only, uh, you cannot isolate the South African banks and call it, call it a political thing because there are also a number of big international banks involved involved as well. So I don't think there's, there's, there's any doubt uh, of, from the initial information, it would appear that the banks are, are, are certainly guilty and we've already seen a number of banks uh, overseas from um, some of the big banks already paying their fines. Um, but what it does open up is a whole political issue issue as well, which the banks will find it difficult to, to um, separate from the actual uh, um, banking issues that there are. Yeah, let me get your reaction, especially the reaction of uh, the economy at the moment. How has it reacted? I know that uh, some banks have already been exonerated, but really, what's the reaction in the market, at the stock market? Uh, there hasn't been much, much reaction yet. Uh, it appears to be a bit of a wait and see at the moment. Uh, and it would look like the market uh, is in fact expecting that the fines will not be absolutely absolutely large. Uh, if that was the case, I think we would have seen the banking shares dropping uh, a good deal more than they actually have. All right, so at the end of trading today, what do you think is really going to be like? Do you think the stock market, knowing that banks actually dominate activities at the, at the stock market, do you think is going to actually turn out positive? Uh, I'm not sure about positive, but it would appear that the effect would not be so largely negative as we could have, as we could have expected. All right, Charles Kiek, CEO and Chief Energy uh, Economist, Afri Forsyth, South Africa. Many thanks for your time on Business Zone. Pleasure. All right, we'll take a break now on Business Zone. And when we come back, we'll look at the issue of Samsung Group Chief Jay Lee on the latest scandal. It's Business Zone on TVC News with me, MC Landry Ido. Samsung Group Chief Jay Lee is the latest victim of arrest in the ongoing corruption scandal rocking South Korea, dealing a fresh blow to the world's biggest maker of smartphones and memory chips. Koreans have expressed mixed feelings over the arrest of Samsung Group Chief Jay Lee over his alleged role in a corruption scandal rocking the highest levels of power in South Korea. This is dealing a fresh blow to the world's biggest maker of smartphones and memory chips. The 48-year-old Lee, heir of the country's richest family, was taken into custody at the Seoul Detention Center after waiting there overnight for the decision. Lee is a suspect in the influence peddling scandal that led Parliament to impeach President Park in December a decision if upheld by the Constitutional Court will make her the country's first democratically elected leader forced out of office. On the streets of South Korea's capital, some people welcomed the court's decision. I expected the arrest would work out this time because it should have happened the last time, but it did not. There was enough evidence this time and the law is fair. 
well done special prosecution team. However, some people were against the arrest and worried about the impact it would have on the economy. I find the arrest a shame. The original direction of the special prosecution was the president Park Hong Yee, but I think because they could not find much about her during investigation, so they have arrested Lee. I assume the influence on our country's economy will be huge. While Lee's detention is not expected to hamper day-to-day -day operations at Samsung firms, experts say it could hinder strategic decision-making at South Korea's biggest conglomerate. As the owner of the company was arrested, it will lead not only to losses for the company, but involve social costs as well. However, South Korea's national system has shown that it will not accept wrongdoing. So, in the long term, there will be a chance to raise South Korea's credibility. Samsung has been in the midst of an ongoing restructuring to clear its succession path for Lee to assume control after his father was left disabled by a heart attack in 2014. Lee's arrest gives a boost to prosecutors who have zeroed in on Samsung Group to build their case against President Park and her close friend Choi Sun Siu, who is in detention and faces the abuse of power and attempted fraud. Ibiemi Aboyade, CBC News. In trucks carrying thousands of tons of cocoa have been blocked at the main port of Ivory Coast, the world's top producer, as authorities have temporarily stalled exports. The head of the National Cocoa Producers Union, Musa Kohn, stated that nearly 700 trucks have been blocked at the port in Abidjan, Ivory Coast economic capital. It said trucks filled with cocoa have also been stranded in San Pedro, the country's second port, for several days. Industry sources say the authorities were blocking cocoa exports because of a difference in the price set by the National Cocoa Council and that in the London Futures Trade Centre. Cocoa represents 15% of Ivory Coast GDP and more than 50% of its export earnings. And that's according to the World Bank. This is about the blocking of cocoa of which all producers have come from all the regions of Ivory Coast to demonstrate for the cocoa to be paid because cocoa is not being bought since mid-November. It is stuck between the two ports of San Pedro and Abidjan, stored in cooperatives in the hands of producers in their plantation, in their field, in their camps. And the governor of the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, John Mangudia, has introduced a U.S. at a $70 million exchange stabilization facility to be disbursed by the end of February. The facility will tackle current delays in the processing of payments for the procurement of import, and Mangudia's intervention comes at a time the country's productive sector is in a gridlock due to procurement delays. Timely importation of fuel and payments for electricity import have been hampered by darkness and transport complications. Among other interventions, Mangudia audits that banks ensure lending rates remain below 12% per annum. Effective cargo examination in Nigeria will continue to be a, an uphill task for the Nigerian Customs Service until scanners and other machines are made available in the port where their argument their trade will not be facilitated without the necessary port tools. Recent developments in Nigeria's sea ports and land borders with regards to the importation and smuggling of illegal consignments have necessitated calls for a thorough cargo examination by officers of the Nigeria Customs Service. Presently, scanners at the various ports are not working and so containers are checked manually. But how effective is Customs 100% examination without the necessary working tools? And whose responsibility is it to make these tools available? You have a container fully loaded with heavy equipment and you want human beings to bring those equipment as individuals out from the container? It's very difficult. It's the duty of the terminal operator to provide all the equipment. The, the cargo belongs to customs. 
the terminal operator hold the goods in custody for customs. By the time the customs asks for inspection to do fiscal examination to see the content of the container to evaluate it, then after that the customs now will give out instruction release. No doubt the recourse to manual examination of containers comes with a high price. We need a forklift that will just move in the smaller ones and bring those equipments out or whatever consignment, then you can now do a hundred percent examination. And that's why the control general have said. He said even if it will take us two days to do one container, it doesn't matter anymore. If you are now delaying the cargo, it's going to increase the cost. Because the moment there is cost, it will be transferred to the public. This turnaround cannot be made as regards to moving the part of the port. So it is a very it is a, it's a chain. Whenever there is a delay at a particular place, it takes a very serious effect. Meanwhile, the customs authority will continue to contend with the issue of false declaration and other evasive antics by importers who try to dodge payment of duties until government installs scanners at the ports. People want to evade now that the recession has come in now, now to, 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 to get foreign exchange, to go for importation. Oh, it's very difficult. Oh, it's very hard. You want to now cut corner. In the process, you ended up causing a delay for yourself. The need for government to read the riot act to terminal operators have been underscored by many who believe that they reneged on the port concession agreement. Ifunanya, Eze, TVC News, Lagos. Well, the Kaduna International Airport facility is set to be at 92% ready for the influx of traffic that will be diverted from the Inamdi Ezekiel International Airport at the nation's capital, Abuja, which will be closed for repairs from March the 8th. Well, manager of the airport, Amina Ozi Salami, made the disclosure. A tour of Kaduna International Airport shows different levels of upgrades in each department. From fire tenders, terminal building, control tower to instrument landing system. Manager Kaduna International Airport Amina Ozi Salami is optimistic that the facility would be ready for use before the 28th of February, adding that the airport is facing some challenges. Before the 8th of March, there is going to be some kind of a simulation and then we would have had more staff from Abuja Airport. As uh, I think they are bringing in more people, like I think 57 of them from Abuja. Chairman Movement to Kaduna Mohamed Georgi said that the capacity of the airport has been enhanced to accommodate wide bodied aircraft with the installation of instrument landing system. While project engineer to the contractor handling the new terminal building said the project's major components had been completed. You can capture it right from 50 miles away to the runway. Mm. Beautiful and so on and so forth. The second one is called glide slope, which I will go to show you on the other end. Guys mm. show you a descent angle so they don't hit the ground. So this is a brand new, everything is alright, well earthed. Then there's a special power house there, which we can use also solar. We have all materials on ground. The fittings will be on ground. That's just what is written. That's what we're waiting for to start fixing the, the ceiling. As you can see, it's only ceiling that you know that's not that has not been fixed. At the fire tenders, head fire and safety Abubakar Shebe yeah, said three fire tenders were functional, while others were being repaired, adding that the government has pledged to provide additional new ones to enable the department attain category nine. Also was here even yesterday, and they have already promised us that they are going to give us another brand new fire tender, which is almost like E1 again. So with that one, I think uh, even though they are talking about they have, even if they have uh, anything more than category nine, I think we are up to tax of facing the challenge of the firefighter. And we have enough homes available around us. We have water. All the facilities are on ground. The air traffic controller on duty, Jatun Nehemiah, disclosed that the communication equipment and other navigational aids were being deployed for effective operation during the period. The navigational aids are being worked on and so as you can see there are some things that have been replaced and there's so much work going on now. While ground handling firms, helicopter companies, oil marketing firms and others are said to have indicated interest in relocating from Abuja to Kaduna Airport, their absence was conspicuous during the tour. Lillian Ezemark, 
TVC News, Kaduna. The Indian government has approved air services agreement to Rwanda. The agreement allows an enhanced and seamless connectivity while ensuring greater safety and security. Earlier this year, Rwanda Air announced that it will commence direct flights to India's commercial center Mumbai on April the 3rd. The union cabinet met with the Prime Minister Narendra Modi which approved the air services agreement. The agreement has the potential to spur greater trade, investment tourism, and cultural exchange between India and Rwanda. And the Rwandan government and the Kingdom of Belgium have signed a financing agreement to support electricity access rollout program through Rwanda Energy Group. The agreement will see Belgium contribute $10.6 million, while the government of Rwanda will inject another 2 million euros into the entire project. The Minister of Finance and Economic Planning, Cleva Gatete, said the grant will improve access to electricity services by households and public institutions. And the minister also said that overall aim of the intervention was to provide sufficient, reliable and affordable energy for Rwandans. Well, crude oil prices stayed mixed in the global market Friday. Uh, the same with Thursday. At the London market, the Brent trades for $55 per barrel, and price reduction comes nearly 1% uh, as oil dealers resist paying higher price pegs. For the OPEC basket brand, price studies are $53 a barrel. That's Business Zone. Many thanks for watching. I am Yemi Silan Ray Ido. I'll leave you with the global stock figures and that of the exchange rate as it stands at the moment.